we'll have a, we got about one more minute here, and then we'll get started. Andy, we are recording. All right, sounds good there, John. Well, welcome everybody to another uh, forecast builder webinar. I should actually count how many we're up to right now. I think we've probably done uh, anywhere six to eight of these already. Um, and of course, as you as you know, we're getting towards the well towards the end of the experiment, but we'll touch on that here in a little bit. Um, again, we have the map here of the offices showing where everybody's at in terms of between the full and light versions. Um, if you if you believe your office is, in, is incorrect there, uh, please email the um, the forecast builder, the team, the you know nws.forecastbuilder at noaa.gov, or you can go to our VLab site and post a note there to adjust. Uh, either one can get can get in contact with us. So today's uh, today's topics for this webinar it's actually going to be a, a shorter one. Um, first, I kind of want to do a little overview of the uh, of this forecast builder experiment to kind of show the various tentacles, if you will, of <laughs> where this experiment is. Uh, obviously, too, as, as you know, we're coming towards the end of this, so talk about the future. Um, we do want to look back at the February 23rd, 24th storm here. Talk a little bit about a little bit about Prob Ice present with that. Uh, we'll go into some tech topics. Uh, touch a little bit on wintry mix. Uh, and then a little, and then the open discussion as usual at the end. So, uh, yeah, something I was um, kind of thinking about here. I think it came off the last maybe grid grid methodology team call, and and really even the last last quite a few grid methodology team calls is how how many different areas forecast builder um, works, and, you know, interacts with, and you know, just kind of you know. Maybe a little bit of a cheesy graph, but or chart, but just really wanted to show everybody to get an idea of what we're kind of dealing with with all these tentacles. That uh, you know, we we do these webinars. Um, we've got a tech side, obviously, that's going going on all the time. There's the science and ways to improve. Whether it's how do you improve p-types or can we improve the fram, which we've done uh, during the experiment. Uh, you know, integrity checks, working with that, improving that. We've done some of that during the experiment. There's, of course, the um, blowing snow research. I know there's some, they're working on that more up in, uh, in the North Dakota offices. Uh, we've got improvements going on with the, blend, uh, with the blends. Uh, you know, we've got, of course, interactions with, the in, with labor management. And then, uh, you know, been working here and integrating aviation in, inside. Trying to even look at starting to integrate some fire maybe here on the uh, over the course of the, the this here the spring and summer months. Uh, I know there's a Nash, there's some national team that's kind of loosely organized looking at that, uh, but we're looking at it as well on the grid team because that seems like a perfect perfect place to bring some of the fire weather uh, in from in terms of like integrity check perspective and that. And then uh, we'll touch on here in this. Uh, in this presentation, a little bit about hazard builder and how you know forecast builder could be tied into the DSS process. A little bit about the future for the experiment uh, coming up here over the next couple of weeks. Uh, we, uh, grid methodology team will be hosting some one-on-one -on -one conference calls with the ten uh, ten testbed offices. Um, most of them here scheduled for. You know, the last week of March, and at the start there of our grid methodology team workshop, which is there uh, in a little under a month from now, uh, on the week of April, April 4th. There. Well, while we're at that workshop, uh, we'll be evaluating the, the the feedback that we've received via different mechanisms, the feedback forms, VLab, um, email, uh, survey responses, as, as well as what we obtained from the one-on-one -on -one conference calls. We're also working here to get a new agreement to extend the experiment through May, which allows us, you know, to review the effects, uh, you know, of the last, uh, of the last tech order, and even, and even the one here going into. Uh, we'll have one more tech order coming out here this month. And two, it also gives us time to evaluate feedback from the experiment, 
and uh, and given the fact that winter is is not done, and as, as I see, you know, over the next over this next several days, more cold cold air spreading down into the, into central region. So uh, I know even today there's some ground blizzard warnings up in north uh, up in the Minot area of North Dakota. So we still got winter weather going on, and as I mean, just yesterday having a bout of severe weather, it's good to see how does the forecast forecast builder process work with uh, with severe weather uh, and then uh, here too you know how af after say May you know the, the project status basically will be determined through further adjustments and negotiation through the uh, through the RLC process so make sure you know your voice is heard during our evaluation pe feedback, uh, period via the feedback forms uh, the DLab forum and our you know direct email contact through the nws.forecast builder at noaa.gov. So I did want to talk uh, a little bit about Pro Vice President. Uh, if you remember at the beginning of the forecast builder experiment, we Pro Vice President was one of those parameters that we uh, were just leaving. We left off the cron because the way it was designed had an ambigu ambiguity to it. Um, and you know you could have no prob ice for certain for two different situations, but our goal definitely was to get that on the cron um, because the lack of lack of ice in the cloud can really hurt you whether or not you're dealing with snow or or a liquid a liquid outcome. A classic case of this was with the February uh, the February 23rd 24th uh, storm and. Uh, just some graphics here comparing NDFD to uh, to WPC because the, the WPC I think in this in this case really wasn't um, wasn't accounting for the uh, the the dry spot situation with the lack of ice resulting from that dry spot. Uh, I know it was a concern brought up on some of the conference calls that were going on with WPC from you know the rock rock started up calls there, uh, and you know. You know, pay attention there, especially in Wisconsin. Obviously, this is closer to home for my office here, Lacrosse. So that's why one good reason to bring this bring this to attention. If you look at some of the you know the observed snowfall analysis uh, in comparison with uh, WPC and NDFD, and again the the crux of this event happening. You know, this is a shorter term event here during the night of the you know night of the 23rd going into the 24th. Uh, you know, look at the you know su the southern half of Wisconsin up into south you know east southern and eastern Wisconsin. The the big difference there, and again, this is just what Pro Vice President does to your does to your forecast. Here's an actual image uh, taking you. We're using minus the wrap minus 10 to minus 13 C R R H as a general proxy, if you will. Um, for Pro Vice President, it doesn't contain all of it, but it's at least a decent proxy. And definitely, you notice those low values of 10 to, you know, 10 30 percent extending up from eastern Iowa through uh, eastern eastern Wisconsin into the into the Upper Peninsula, of Michigan. There, reflective of that dry spot area. And what was was kind of interesting about this is that for actually several. Several days, uh, all the global models, you name it, NAM, European, Canadian, and the GFS, all had some idea of this of this dry plot. Uh, and by the time we got to that uh, to that model cycle there on Thursday of the the 23rd, looking at just the the morning runs that came in, uh, in general, you know, they were all keeping southern and eastern Wisconsin up into eastern UP all uh, all out of ice. And uh, this was the main reason, again, why the NDFD snowfall was um, much lower than the WPC, and, uh, and thus also result in, you know, with a better, uh, a better uh, forecast. So I think this is just uh, just to reinforce the point about how important uh, the prob ice present grid is in, in terms of the in terms of the forecast. So. Um, Related to the Pro Vice President here, uh, an important note. I know we've had some uh, feedback discussions going on. You know, op some offices would would go in and delete some of the top-down grids because they just want to, you know, force the force rain snow scenario. But please uh, do not remove these 
within within that first three days that you have that re, you know where the crying you know is doing that population doing that population and there's a couple reasons the first um, it's it's part of a previous forecast so if you remove the top down grid well then the, when the super bun runs the next time around it doesn't have that it doesn't have a previous component, so you're just going to go with whatever the models models give you. And then they're also helpful for collaboration uh, collaboration purposes. There are other ways to get around it if you you know if you feel you know you you look at soundings and man you know you're like there's no way that this is going to have a you know, it's going to re result in a you know freezing rain, sleet outcome, and you just want, it's just going to be rain snow. Uh, if it looks like that, there are two options. The first is to set prob ice present to 100, which removes any of the freezing rain drizzle concern. And the second would be to, uh, is also to set the, the max wet bulb below zero. Uh, that, so that will basically cause your surface temperature to dictate where rain, rain and snow would occur. On the flip side, um, if you know if the environment is favoring more freezing rain, rain versus the uh, versus sleet and snow, you know this is this is a case where maybe a dry spot is coming into play. For example, then for this, you could just drop your prob ice present values, um, get them closer to zero, uh, and or increase your max wet bulb towards four Celsius. Uh, and then this is all kind of discussed in the back in the initial training that we did back in. Uh, right before winter winter season got going. All right, jumping on to some tech stuff here. Uh, what we've got coming up. I know there's been a lot of uh, discussion on this uh, topic coming through with sleet. Um, we discussed it on the last last webinar. Uh, based on the feedback we've received. Uh, we're going to remove the sleet caused with the situation where your max level is between 0 and 1 and the surface temperature is less than the rain threshold. So, you know, some far, you know, if, you're, if your surface temperature was 34, for example, and your uh, max level was 0.7 Celsius, you know, something that you know, you're, you're kind of hugging close to the zero C isotherm, uh, you would end up with 100% uh, for both rain, sleet, and snow. That's that's gone, um, so that will be, you know, removed out of in this tech order. However, we still need to figure out a way how to resolve this because these situations do happen. Uh, we've we've got we've got cases. In fact, there was one a couple weeks ago that went through the uh, Midwest, albeit maybe sleet sleet wasn't as dominant, requiring 100 percent, but there was a lot, definitely a lot of sleet observations occurring. Um, so. This, is, this will be something that will be investigated during the off season. Some thoughts going on with maybe, you know, can we redefine prob refree sleep? Maybe there's an idea of switching to like a negative negative energy area, something like that. Mm -hmm. Another issue, that especially 16.41 brought about, was uh, Superline and Conshore both having some, you know, period, more, more, uh, Failures happening where you'd have to run run it out of the product scripts menu. Uh, some of the some fixes have been incorpor incorporated, so uh, you know look for that to be coming with that this tech order. Hazard Builder, which I touched on a little bit at the beginning of the presentation, this is uh, this is something new that uh, uh, it's kind of similar for those that are familiar with the uh, enhanced uh, hazardous weather outlook. Uh, it's going to be kind of similar to the, you know, similar to that, and with a hopeful goal of probably replacing it. Uh, it's in its initial form, what's going to be coming out is more of like an it's an automatic situational awareness procedure. Uh, it may, in fact, the way that we just get deployed may come out in different different parts that we may not re really see what it fully is for, um, you know, a month month or two here down the road. But just want to let you know that there's going to be some components of this this new thing called Hazard Builder in, in place. Um, something else I think that would be helpful here for those um, that have been, you know, looking at tar you know, targets of opportunity since, uh, you know, there's been discussion, how do we how do we determine that? Well, there's a new, going to be a new procedure in this tech order called model certainty, which allows you to 
uh, display statistical parameters about a certain weather element. You know, okay, how how much how much standard deviation is there amongst uh, this parameter based on all the various screen data sets that you have available to you in GFE? Uh, what's the average? What's the mean? Or you know, mode and all those different parameters. So I think that will be you know kind of helpful. Uh, I know, like take for example this February 23rd, 24th storm. This is a great case of of if we're looking at like high temperatures, it was for like that Friday. There was some massive model spreads and. Uh, standard deviations pushing five within just the model guidance we had in GFE. So it kind of, you know, give you some key to where things are, you know, really uncertain. Some other things coming, uh, we're going to adjust the cron times um, just slightly uh, just to help to address ISC traffic because there's still issues um, out there. Uh, idea here is that they're just, these are five minute adjustments. So for the eastern time, eastern time zone and Great Lakes offices, we'll, we'll keep it there at 17.30, so you'll see no change. A little farther west, you go through the rest of central time, uh, we'll, we'll back it up a little bit for, uh, to five, you know, 17.35 and 5, 5.35Z. And then the mountain time zone to 5, 5.40 and 17.40. Just hoping that this, this, because it seems like there's just too much IC grid going across, Hopefully this will rectify that um, rectify that problem and allow for uh, easier um, or, or less problems with these. You know, some occasionally it's like having a problem with not seeing ISC data from another office. Another thing we're going to do is standardize some of the parameters that are sent up to NDFDM point and click. Part of this is related to the point and click refract refractor and update, which hopefully most of you have seen has been postponed until the 14th. Uh, you know, right now, the way that the program is set up to do sending your grids up to the point and click, by default, it sends uh, it sends everything. <laughs> so that is, uh, you know, that is way too much stuff going up. It's bandwidth. It's a band, you know, be a bandwidth hog. It's, you know, there's a lot better ways to do that. Plus, the point and click refractor and has a set list of parameters and what units those can be in. So uh, we'll address that with this tech order. Also incorporated for, for for forecast builder is a new quick OBS ESTF update option. Um, the idea here is trying to replace fully the ESTF data loan and blend. I mean it's it's been it's been replaced, but needs a little bit similar functionality to that procedure. So there's going to be a new option that all and this option also will update past QPF and uh, the top down grids. Uh, via some stuff that's already in your OBS database. Another thing we'll do, because uh, with the last tech order, we brought in some of the SREF probability of thunders uh, uh, information. Uh, now we're going to bring some of that into GFE in terms of at least being able to view that as part of the, in the non-precipitation type step. So we'll have that available to you. All right. I wanted to. I, this is something I drafted up here right before the right before the call. Just some other tech items to watch out for because these have these have come up occasionally. Um, something I've noticed six, uh, sixteen four one, and also here we've, in the, even in seventeen one one, I believe this is the case. Uh, um, that service backup that if left open for a while will cause mo models to decode slower for GFE. Why? I'm not sure. We're going to probably, probably open up a ticket with NCF on this, but uh, because, I mean, EDEX, we've got two servers run into decode data. They, they should be able to keep up. Um, you know, thus, it, you know, if you start noticing sometimes your grids, you know, that are not matching up with other offices, um, sometimes we've noticed that, you know, that can be like a missing Canadian, but if you know, sometimes it can also be that you may have had a service backup left open. Uh, and uh, so make sure that if you're doing service backup, to make sure to exit cleanly after the service backup is ended. Another thing that you can do to also help uh, you know, with model decoding and all that is ensure you, uh, you're you not decoding more ISC data than you really need to. Um, certainly, if you're state office, you're probably going to have to decode more because you know, you got that S SFT product. But for other sites, um, 
you know, if you go into, you know, if you're, you know, you're maybe you have a thought of, well, I need to get the ISP data for service backup purposes. Well, when you get into service backup, that service, you need to request the ISP data anyway for that purpose. So just make sure, you know, just take a moment, take a look and see, you know, do I need all this ISC data that I'm bringing in right now? You know, getting rid of extra ISC data will help with, you know, like the forecast builder con and receiving grids, um, you know, and you, this doesn't get in the way of mo uh, model decoding, things like that. Oh, I should have put a par par <laughs> paragraph on this one. Winter remix. Uh, hopefully many of you, um, Saw Chicago's talk there last uh, last week on the Burgoyne top down. Uh, another looking at it, a different way to approach the top down process using positive and negative areas versus the max buff bulb and probably free sleet. Uh, it, you know, we did want to bring bring up that in in both techniques, there is a portion of the parameter space that both of them have both of them struggle with. Maybe it's a little less in the Burgoyne, hard to, hard to stay at this juncture. Um, it does seem to be though that when you get in the before going, I think it's less about less than 100 or so of positive and negative areas. That seems to be a, a parameter space that has a little bit of problem determining p-type. Uh, you know, go, additionally, not just looking at the uncertainties with respect to our top-down approaches. When you go into the re research for doing obs observations to develop these techniques, uh, you got various issues that you have to deal with, whether or not METARs were augmented versus non-augmented. You got balloon drifts. Uh, sometimes your p-types are oscillating around rayob time. Uh, what do you call that? You know how you know how far was that p-type observed from the rayob? You know do you got to restrict that and you know what what's too far away to be considered? So as we've gone through this ex experiment, and I mean definitely uh, we've noticed that. We end up with a lot of messy weather, messy weather grids, and it, it seems it seems like a wintry mix type is is definitely needed for for weather. Uh, there is a certain space. It's, I mean, it's just hard to determine what type it's going to be. Uh, it's, so based on the feedback, I think you know this is something that we're going to you know, look at at the grid methodology team meeting, uh, and probably try and make some recommendation up the line to to have this. Uh, you still you still don't need to have some probabilities of types determined. I mean, even though we put wintry mix in the weather grid, we need something to help develop a, the, the snow on an ice acume. So uh, we still need to come at that from the best shot that we can. You know, go, maybe just go equal probabilities on some on some of the types until we can get that further refined. And with that, I'll open it up for comments. Uh, just raise your hand, and I'll uh, I'll unmute you. Okay, Bruce, I, I see your hand up. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, just uh, really more of a comment than anything. Sorry I was a little late getting on board the call here. Um, you know, the wintry mix uh, piece, I know we talked about it on the last call and a couple other times. You guys know far more than I do about the, the pros and cons and the issues involved with that, but uh, I definitely like the idea of pursuing that. Uh, for all the reasons we talked about. I mean, P-type, when you get into these borderline cases, has so many little nuances and, and natural fluctuations that take place. And, you know, I think we want to be as precise as the science allows, but uh, at some point, the precision seems to be more than, than what is actually observed. So uh, I, I think it's a great option. It'll be interesting to see where that discussion goes. Thanks, Bruce. Yeah, I mean... Yeah, and then, and then the worst part is like you throw any kind of convective element on top of it, you could be in a freeze and drizzle, freeze and drizzle case, and then the moment you throw a convective on top of it, you're dealing with sleet and snow mixed in, and uh, which you know, anytime you see these more showery stuff kind of go through, that's what's exactly happening. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I do have one other question, um, and I don't know if this has been been thought about at all. It's more in the in in the communication and delivery of our forecast information via the point and click, but uh, I'm sure others have observed this as well, but you know, with, with, with our mixed precip and, and really any transitions in precip or even the inclusion of thunder and all with, with the hourly grid resolution that we're getting now, uh, is anybody else 
um, you know, noted the in incredible precision that gets into the point and click forecast with just these little one hour variations in, in, in precipitation references, maybe on a day, to, uh, on a period two or period three forecast. And are people comfortable with that? Or is that something where maybe the, the I don't know if it's Mark Mitchell or who it is that maintains uh, the point and click, if there could be some, some uh, thought to potentially making it a little less precise um, but still reflective of expected weather conditions. You know what I'm asking? Just, there's a lot of precision that's being introduced into that by virtue of, of, our, of our high temporal resolution in our grids. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, great, it's a great question. I know at least at our office, you know, where we've had been doing, we've been doing this certainly for, with a probably weather type for a very long, very long time, there actually hasn't been a lot of feedback about, um, to our office about that, um, you know, where you can go slight chance of rain and snow between 7 a.m. and noon, and then a slight chance of rain between noon and 2, and then a slight chance of rain and snow after 2, or something like that. Uh, we haven't received really much feedback on that, but it would seem like uh, something logical, which, you know, we, we could see, we could see done to help, uh, you know, to help that. Yeah, and you know, as, as I've brought that up with other people, I've heard everything from, yeah, I guess I hadn't considered that, maybe it is too much precision to you know what, it's it's what's reflected in the forecast and just let it happen and don't worry about it. So uh, I'm sure there's yeah. a lot of you on that. Yeah, I mean, I know what the, you know, if you take it from the zone forecast uh, approach that, you know, the, the overrides that we have in with the central region CFP um, thing where we only do six hour analysis groups. Um, so you're, you're, you're only gonna get like one type in the morning, one type in the, you know, one, one statement for the morning, one statement for the afternoon, and that's it. Um, you know, is you know, it's almost like one of those things of the user, you know, the user community for looking at our point and click versus user community looking at hourly weather graphs versus yeah, all these very different. <laughs> yeah, uh, you, you you could almost envision a, a service delivery model, and and I know we're the the, uh, the point and click and and that change that was supposed to take place is in the news right now, and it's being you know we pushed it forward another week, but. With with the hourly resolution now being added in there with that with that supplemental tab, and this is maybe more of an ISD type delivery issue than than SSD stuff, but you know you could see a a model where the the, the general worded forecast is a, is a little dumbed down from a detail standpoint in lieu of all that detail that would reside in the hourly information. Yeah. Yeah. That's all I've got. Anybody else have questions? Certainly have time. All right, Lyle, uh, I have you un unmuted. Thanks, Andy. Uh, much less philosophical question here that I have. Um, <laughs> I, I have a, uh, we just got upgraded to 1641 here in Lincoln, and uh, we're going to be doing a backup next week. And I, I just caught your comments there about the uh, decoding issues that have popped up in service backup. Um, you mentioned for a while. You say if it's open for a while. Are we talking yeah. like during a regular shift or if someone left it open from the day before or what What has all other yeah. offices been? Yeah, I've heard like, like I've heard comments of like, you know, people have had it left open for like three days and yeah, they, you know, but even after a uh, I've noticed even here, back when we were on 16.41, um, when I left it open for like a, like one, I think it was like a day, uh, that I started noticing like the, like for example the Canadian took so looked like took an extra hour longer to decode than it did before. Um, hmm. But but yeah, uh, I don't know if Chicago's on, but Chicago just had this issue. Um, here late last late last week, and like even their GFS was not getting decoded in GFE. Like 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 only the first 72 hours or something of the GFS was available for the for the 12Z super uh, 12Z super blend run. So kind of, but they had again they had it open for like two or three. I think service backup open two or three days, um, if I remember correctly. Okay, so we're talking just a sh regular shift. Probably not going to see a big issue. No. There. Is that no. reasonable? 
Okay, I just want to make sure what I pass on to the forecasters so that they are uh, they are aware of the issue. So, thanks, Andy. Anybody else have questions? Uh, I've seen something coming across. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to open up the question tab, and I'm so thin. Uh, Chuck, can you act, can you see that question a little bit better? I saw one for about it's about sat saturation and condensation with respect to ice yes. and all that. Uh, yeah, Dave said we've noticed the probability of ice is always lower in the. Yeah, it must be yeah, in the okay. Well, we can let's we can go ahead and uh, unmute him. Maybe he, he could just ask it himself. Yeah. Hey, da David, can you? David, I have you unmuted. If you wanna. But I think I, I think I know what he's talking about because I've had communication with, in the past with him that, yeah, if you look at... Oh, he doesn't have a microphone. <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the Canadian, if you look at the Canadian Global, you know, and the CMCNH there, uh, it only tops out there 80%. That's something we're going to, like, keep taking a look at and maybe I'll make an adjustment with this next National SmartNet version to maybe go with a lower... Uh, lower threshold is why yeah, it's, it's, it's odd because I know I've been pulling up sometimes I'll pull up a straight like being Canadian uh, RH at 850 for example and I'll get higher RH values but some for some you know I'll get the 95 to 100 percent but for whatever reason like in this spectrum minus 10 to minus um, 13 C not seeing that so uh, not exactly sure what's going on because we are sent when we the Canadian that is sent to us. We get temperature. I can't remember if it's temperature and dew point or temperature and RH. Um, can't remember, but uh, through the LDM. So, yeah, we'll keep taking a look at that and see what we can do to resolve why the Canadian cannot produce higher um, higher RH values in a. It seems it certainly you know now now I'm pulling one up. It certainly seems that in in a colder in colder air, um, not so much of a problem in you know in the warmer say great you know temperatures greater than zero. But when you get below zero with the air at 850, that you know it it, it struggles to, to saturate. So yeah, I mean there is a in the prob in the prob ice present how it's calculated. It does convert the it does convert it to, uh, with respect to ice. Uh, that's the way that the ops aircraft observations were uh, were found. All right. Anybody else have questions? Hey, Andy. This is Chuck. Yeah. Yeah. I would just like to. Uh, Add a comment, and maybe you can go back to that slide where you showed the big uh, octopus chart of all the things that the forecast builder touches. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, it related to this. Um, I'm not sure if, if everyone on this call is aware that um, our team, uh, principal members of the GMAT team, will be meeting with members of the DSS team, and also uh, I believe the web team will be part of that meeting as well. And um, other other parts of uh, ongoing teams across the, the the central region, including the consistency team, to try to really tie all this together and come up with a, a good plan going forward, uh, building on what we put together here with Forecast Builder, but also taking advantage of some of the synergy that we're seeing in this chart, and that I, hopefully most of you guys have noticed in your offices as well. Um, now that we have a more cohesive and, and um, uh, a, a standard method of producing our grids, we can take advantage of that to um, have some more standardization to the DSS we provide. And um, an example of that is the hazard builder role that we're, is going to be played uh, as part of forecast builder as well. Um, but that meeting is going to take place in the next couple of weeks, and we're going to really try to uh, hammer out some uh, good ideas and, and where we can go from here once we've kind of built a bit of a foundation with the forecast process. And take it to the next stage. We're really feeding the the DSS of, of the offices in a very uh, 
uh, sensible and well-supported manner from our team and, and the region as a whole. And um, just look forward to uh, hearing more about that um, as we go forward with this project. And um, we'll, we'll keep you updated. And I, I think you'll, you'll see a lot of neat things able to come out of um, what we're doing as we get all these teams together and make sure we're all uh, working in the same direction. Yeah, thanks, Chuck, for that. Uh, head on. Definitely. All right. Well, uh, final call. Any other questions? All right. Otherwise, uh, t again, test bed offices uh, uh, expect to, you know, to looking for a call or you know something like that from the grid methodology team in the next uh, couple weeks um, and that's all we have Bruce did you have a last minute comment no I, I uh, it's not really that important I just wanted to build on Chuck's comments uh, regarding the, the, the meeting coming up uh, uh, to you, Chuck, and Andy, and maybe a couple other people on the call, I'll, I'll get uh, some dialogue going this week to begin to, to get our agenda together for those for those three days. And that's going to be, be be here before we know it. So uh, we'll get we'll get some discussion going now to get uh, get our agenda in place so we've got you know good focus for those three days and come out with some tangibles. You know, co coming from uh, coming from a field office here and serving in this TDY position, uh, I'm already already a month into it. Hard to believe, but. You know, I'm I'm, uh, I'm amazed uh, uh, and, and appreciative, I guess, of how how uh, patient the, the field has been in moving forward with a lot of these initiatives. And you know, we've we've heard about uh, DSS initiatives, and of course, we're moving forward uh, in in a great way with Forecast Builder and, and coming up with some great results. And as Chuck said, this is going to be our opportunity to begin to pull some of these things together and hopefully uh, clarify and communicate you know expectations going forward the, the regional director really wants this laid out pretty clearly for the next for the next couple of years and uh, you know and really clarify expectations for the field so that's really going to be our main goal and uh, we'll get that agenda in place here real soon and then the rest of the field can look forward to hearing some results from that in the coming weeks All right, with, with that, uh, wish everyone a good rest of the month here in March, and uh, be looking for that tech order to come out here in the next, uh, hopefully the next two, the next two weeks, hopefully, be the plan. Uh, thanks, Andy. Thanks, Chuck. Have a good day, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody.